introductory to bamboo rod building, and he's got, he's got a slideshow and some videos that we're going to present. Paul, you can take it away. And so when I was a member of the Isaac Walton Club, and that was about 40 years ago, uh, I met a guy by the name of Ted Knott, and I spoke about him last time we were talking about reels because he got me interested in old reels. We also got me interested in old bamboo fly rods because he had one for sale. He brought it in and I'll get a better shot of that later on. But just wanted to give you a sense. This is one that he had actually restored. And Ted uh, is a, you know, a beloved uh, bamboo rod builder here in Southern Ontario when, when he was alive. And this is one of the rods that he refurbished. And I just wanted to bring that up because it's a point in the, in the presentation. So here's the question. Should you buy a bamboo fly rod if you want to use one? Should you restore an old bamboo fly rod if you can find one? Or should you make your own? And a lot of people think, I would think, that making your own is really beyond the capability of most uh, average people, but actually it's not, and I'll explain that to you. So uh, a number of people will inherit a bamboo fly rod. We, we sort of talked about inheriting stuff in our last presentation. And um, if you wanted to use it, you'd consider restoring it if it didn't have all the parts. Usually when you get a rod, let me just whip around here, pick up an old rod at a, uh, at a flea market or an antique shop. This won't be as clear as the shots later, but you'll find out that it's the finish is gone on it. Parts are missing. The guides are no longer there. The handle may be coming off. You can buy a vintage rod that's in fishable condition. And there, you see them on eBay, Kijiji. And again, if it's something needs to be restored, you have the same kind of risks. You can buy a brand new bamboo rod a Brand X rod on Amazon. I just checked recently, they're about 300 US dollars, I guess it is. But they're probably mass produced in uh, overseas and probably not the best quality components. And the way they built it is probably questionable. And as we get into the presentation, you'll kind of understand, hopefully you'll understand why I say that and why it matters a lot. You could buy a, um, a bamboo rod from a specialty re retailer. I understand that Orvis, for example, still sells them. That's like a, a well-known maker, but that's you're going to spend three thousand U.S. dollars to get an Orvis branded bamboo fly rod. You could also buy from an individual maker, and there are lots of local makers here in Ontario. Um, there are lots of them worldwide, and you know. I'll just pick one out of the air that I noticed. Don Anderson is his name. He's in Western Canada. He makes rods kind of like I do. He's a little more sophisticated or more expert at it. And he charges about $1,500 uh, for a rod. And then you have to pay for shipping. And then there are some very bespoke rods. So things like the, the stripping guide will be extra special. They'll be like jewelry and... Um, uh, they may have some special materials in the handle or uh, there will be some kind of jewelry aspect to the rod. And brand name like Oyster is a very pricey rod. That's like a $10,000 rod. You could also take a course and learn how to build a rod from an expert. And then so you basically go to a class for, say, a three days or a week, and they show you all the steps but they actually do most of the work and they'll have specialty power tools to help speed up the process, which is something we don't do. Or I don't do, but you could get our finished rod in a week, uh, finished except for the final finishing, maybe the gluing that would take extra time. Uh, but you're using a, like a power beveler and that costs money. And I, there was another fellow I ran into from the Western US, Pacific Northwest. He teaches 
And uh, so you go to his place for a week and it's about 1500 US dollars and you pay for travel and accommodations. Well, the other thing that you can do is you can buy a, a blank, a split cane blank to a certain specification and then you can buy the parts and put them on or you can make your own from scratch, which is what I'm going to talk about tonight. So these rods are uh, fishable. You can make them to your own specifications, although there's a, a range of, um, you know, what a, what a rod is capable of doing. And so you want to stay within the range, but you can make your own, you can dress it up the way you want. You can make it inexpensively or, you know, you can put it in as much cost as you want. They look nice and the cast fine and Brian is, uh, is a testament to that. And I've, I've caught a few fish on mine. So this is where it starts if you're going to make your own. Uh, rod builders generally use a special kind of bamboo. It's not your garden variety bamboo that you can build, your, your grow in your backyard or grows in Florida wildly or anything like that. This stuff is called we call it Tonkin bamboo. There are many different uh, species, different scientific names. And this one comes from an area uh, about 100 miles north of Hong Kong, China. And um, there are a couple of brokers in the United States that go over there and grade the poles and they buy them from the uh, farmers and then have them shipped over for rod builders. And the guy that I bought mine from most recently is uh, Angler's Bamboo. He's based in Montana. So the, the combs you see on the left, they grow to like 40 feet tall. And they harvest them for bamboo rod building. Uh, they have to meet certain specifications. And they cut about 12 foot long combs. It's, the, the comb is a 12 foot long piece of bamboo, a round piece like that. And then for uh, builders, usually those are cut in half. So when I work with a, with a bamboo rod, I cut them into six foot lengths and we cut them into strips, which is what you see on the right hand side. Uh, bamboo is kind of like human hair. If, if you see every foot or so along the comb, there's a node. And I'll look at, we'll look at that closer in a minute when I get my, my remote camera going. And so the bane of somebody that wants to build a bamboo fly rod this way is to uh, make those nodes behave like they were, you know, precise piece of metal, <laughs> which is hard to do. If you see in the picture on the right with the strips, once it's split, they all zigzag at every node. And so the, the one good interesting thing about bamboo is that it acts like plastic when it's heated up. So with a, uh, an alcohol lamp, for example, or what I use, a heat gun from Home Depot and a vise, you can heat up the nodes and you can straighten them out. So a close up of the bamboo comb on the right hand side. You see the darker ring around the outside is that's those are the power fibers and those are the that's the, the thing that holds the rod and gives it the action. The, the light colored stuff towards the middle of the comb that's pith like the pith of an orange has no structural support for your rod. So we always work with uh, sections that are on the outside. Now I'm going to mostly talk this evening about hexagonal rods. So a hexagon, six-sided rod, but it's made up of six triangles, six equilateral triangles. You can't see them in the end of that thing that's bound together, but there are six of those triangular strips in it. And here's another view of that when you uh, take a look at the bamboo and uh, what it looks like when you take off the enamel. See the, uh, the, the bright yellow uh, on the outside of the column is enamel or silex. And when you're building a rod that stays on until the very, very end. 
and it's about the thickness of a layer of paint. So very, very thin, a couple of thousandths of an inch. It stays on to the very end and then you scrape it off. This is kind of my bad sketch of a, uh, a spline that makes up one of the six segments that goes in a hexagonal rod. So when you look at it from the end, it's a perfect equilateral triangle, 60 degrees on every corner. And when we make the rod spline, it tapers. Uh, and most of the uh, recipes or the, what they call the taper patterns, uh, they vary in thickness every five inches. Sometimes it's a six inch increment, but my setup's for five inches. So every five inches, the taper of an individual spline changes. So generally it reduces from the base to the tip, not necessarily in a linear fashion. And when you make six identical ones, regardless of the taper, when you bring them together, you get a rod. And it's quite fascinating how minute changes in the taper affect the way the rod casts. And I'm not going to get into this, but I just wanted to say, you know, there are lots of tapers available, recipe, recipes on the internet and, and proprietary ones. And when you're going to build one, it probably helps to have an idea of what it's going to come out like. <laughs> Sometimes you can't tell what weight of line it's going to throw until you actually build it. You could be off, you know, plus or minus a line weight, depending on how well you build it. And um, it's interesting, but you basically can get repetition by following some of the famous patterns and with experience. So after we you know, pulled the strips apart, put them together, we plane them and start binding them. If you're going to build one, there are plenty of books out there on it. The classic book is The Master's Guide to Building a Bamboo Rod. And it was written by Ho Hoagie Carmichael, and it's about Everett Garrison. Garrison was a famous rod maker. And if you went, he made about, I think, 5,000 rods in his lifetime. And if you found an original, like at an auction, in fishable condition, most of them are excellent fishable condition. They are very desirable, and they're like five to ten thousand dollars if you can find one. Uh, and he has some classic designs, and he was the one fellow that applied uh, quantum mechanics, engineering math, to how to construct a, a, a fly rod. And his book is fabulous. It's you know it's old now, but it is something to follow. So then, how did I get into this? I joined the Scarborough Fly and Bait Casting Association, and you've probably heard me talk about them before, and Brian's talked about them. We do a bunch of different things. Rod building was one of the things that attracted me to the club. We do fly casting. Uh, we build nets. You see a net handle down there. The founder of the club, Borg Deval, was um, a champion fly caster, and he made his own bamboo fly rods. And he formed this club for his friends, basically. And he started teaching them how to build bamboo fly rods like he did. But he did it like a hobbyist would do it. So you know, there's one of Gord's books that uh, Brian's holding up. So he said he was an interesting character. He passed away in 2019. And the club goes on. And I started to learn how to do this. I met Gord just once before he passed. Uh, but he saw me working on my first bamboo fly rod, which was nice. And I, be I became pretty competent. And so I ended up becoming the mentor for the club. So if somebody wants to learn how to build a bamboo fly rod, they come to me. And so basically we're doing it in our garages, you know, working on a temporary bench with uh, tools that you can borrow from the club. The key thing that you see in the picture there that you need to make the rod is uh, the adjustable planing form, and I'll explain that in a minute. Gord made up his own tapers, 
So he's got a recipe of them. And generally we start rod builders off with one of his very simple tapers. It's a thicker rod, easy to make, relatively speaking, very forgiving if you make mistakes. And it's something that you can actually complete. Um, so that's why we kind of promote that. So, so what I thought I'd do is I'd show you firsthand how this works. Like if you were coming to the fly casting club, uh, you know, on day one, you said you want to build a fly rod, but you're not quite ready. What's involved? This is, this is what goes on. So I'll tell you. So we start out, uh, the club has bought a small inventory of bamboo, this good Tonkin cane that I talked about. You can see that it's at least where it's cut off at a node, it looks very, very thick. This is the bottom near where the thing was growing out of the ground. So it's very thick there. It's thinner here. We work with this part. And you see the nodes here. We have to get rid of those, but we cannot damage the underlying power fiber, which is right around the edge underneath the enamel. So that's the trick. That's, that's the part you've got to learn. Inside, you know how visible this is, there is a dam. Everywhere there's a node, there's a dam. So what we're going to do is we're going to split this and it's already got a, it's got an age split in it already. And we're going to split this in half and then into quarters and then into 12 pieces and then split each of those in half. So I'll end up, if it goes right and it splits nicely, you get about two dozen strips. I've got a vice mounted on the side and this particular vice is very helpful in splitting the cane. So the piece I'm holding is, I don't know, it's about 1 12th of the, uh, the whole comb. And so what I'm doing is I'm trapping it around where the node is. And I'm gonna take, in this case, I'm using a um, cleaver. <laughs> Since it's Halloween for special effect, I'm gonna use a cleaver. And uh, you, you put the cleaver on the edge where you want it to split and you tap it in. I didn't have mine anchored very well in this video, but it doesn't really matter. I just wanted to get it started and then the, and then the tool acts as a, as a lever. But I'm basically pulling it apart. I'm using my upper body strength to tear, to pull them apart, it's like making a wish. And if you do it right, it follows the grain and you basically get a straight piece. If it starts, it will wander off to the side and it just, you know, bamboo is a natural thing. So if it wanders off to the side, you pull on the side that's got the very thick, the thick sides, the one that you want to apply pressure to. And basically you do this all the way down to the bottom of the column. And I'm just going to speed this up here a little bit because it is like watching grass grow. So it, you just move it down, grip it where the nodes are. It basically tears clean down to the node and then you run into an issue. So that's where you wanna have the clamping pressure so it doesn't tear off to the side. It's kind of an acquired technique after the second or third comb that I'd split. I figured out how to do it for myself and that's how you get the strips. And the strip that I just stripped off, I would cut that in half again. And by the way, basically I never, except for right there, never touch the bamboo with bare hands because you'll get unbelievable cuts and splinters. The stuff just is incredibly strong. People think bamboo rods are fragile. They're not unless you just snap the tip of a finished rod, but, and they're a little bit delicate in the process, but once you have a finished rod, um, you can, now, Hardy used to bend their rods backwards to show how resilient they were, and they are. And you actually need to test every piece of bamboo in theory before you actually put it into a rod. So you have to really like do something like that. When you break it, don't worry, you'll see 10,000 splinters. You'd rather have it break before you build your rod than have it break because you put a weak spot in the rod. Uh, 
generally one spot isn't going to make a difference. And like I said, this stuff can be bent under heat. So just even though I bent that, it's not fatal for that piece. So then we have to start shaping it. And as I showed you in one of the diagrams, the objective here is to get a perfect equilateral triangle, something that looks like this, one of those. That's my focus on the end. I have a, a camera that I can't really focus here. So you want to get a perfect equilateral triangle. Well, we have a form that's a very wide one position form and we stick our oblong stick in it and then we start planing on the top like this until we get a triangle. And then we continue until we get a triangle that fits into this finer form. And this is where we plane our strips to a taper. A little quick video of me planing. And this was in the winter time, I went into my my real room of all places, I put a tarp down so it wouldn't get sawdust all over. And I have, it's not this adjustable form, but it's another one and I'm working on a tip section. So it does uh, fit into the form when you get to this stage and it gets very, very thin. And you need to have extremely sharp plain blade for, I don't know what it is, there's silica or something in the bamboo that absolutely destroys metal tools. So you'll do you know half a dozen licks and then you'll find out it's dull. You'll feel that it's pulling. And it's great when the bamboo is thick, but when you get close to the end with the very, very thin tip, much thinner than you see there, it gets very fragile. And if you happen to hit a node with the plane blade and it doesn't actually slice through, it will pull and I've broken a rod tip like that far from the top. And that basically sets you back and you have to go make another whole strip, which may or may not be a problem. So you're constantly checking as you're planing to see if it's uh, triangular. And we have a couple of tools that help you along the way. It's a tool maker's thread gauge also known as a fishtail gauge. And it happens to have the key feature for us is it has a a 60 degree groove in it. Actually, it's got three different sizes and you can hold it on the rod to judge whether you're getting perfect triangles or not. It doesn't judge size. The size is measured in a different way. And uh, there I'm using a straight vernier caliper which measures in thousandths of an inch. Here is a version of it. It's a digital vernier caliper, and it's all. It's got a uh, a sixty degree groove in this custom made block. Somebody made that. It's called a wire block, named after the guy that invented it. And you basically put your sixty degree bamboo in there, and it gives you a very accurate measurement. So this tool has two bolts every five inches along its length, and one bolt pushes and one bolt pulls. And in here, there's a groove, maybe a little hard to see from where you are. Let's see if I can get down there a little bit closer. So it's a little bit without causing calamity. So it's hard to see, but on the top edge here, inside, there's a 30 degree chamfer on one side and a 30 degree chamfer on the other side. And so you push and pull those to get the measurement that you need across the spline. So one side is generally used for a, a butt section because the strips are wider. And the other side is used, it's also got a groove. And that would be, say, for the tip section. And when I make my rod, when I have a formula, a taper that I'm going to make, all of the 
depths that I need to set my plane form are marked out here every six inches along the form, every five inches along the form. So I know exactly how to set it up. And I have a tool here, which is a, it's a depth gauge. So if I put this down flat, it said zero, which is the top. And when I let my, I have a 60 degree point in here. When the 60 degree point goes into the 60 degree groove, it gives me a depth reading and I can actually control the depth with my bolts. See how I'm moving the dial there? I'm loosening the form. And because it's depth, it's the numbers are going backwards. You have to see it up close to, to get it, but that is basically how we control the, uh, the taper that we need to form the splines of the rod. So we, we plane, plane, plane. And when you're starting out, you can you know, take large shavings off. I don't know if anybody here does woodwork. It's a little bit like woodwork, but bamboo is, like I said, it's grass and it behaves quite a bit differently. So after I have uh, plane six roughly, I bind them in a, it's a method that is kind of like a girdle. When you have the threads going back and forth, it allows you to change the shape of the rod. It allows you to flatten out a rod that is crooked because you can roll it like dough and it will hold its place. Or if you have a severe bend, you can, uh, you can bend it back. And so this particular one that I'm holding, if, if you can see, I just have to change the angle just in my ear. Excuse me, moving the camera around here, I'm making everybody seasick. But um, so you can see that this is, if I look down it, you look down it, it's pretty straight compared to how it started out, it's very crooked. So what happened was, uh, I bound all my pieces and then I have an oven. You heat it up. Like I said, heat can be used to straighten these out. So I actually bought a, a four inch diameter stove pipe and I run a heat gun in it and you know, five minutes flipped one way and five minutes flipped another way at about 320 or so degrees. And when I bring it out, and it's, it's now very pliable, so I can roll this out, and the girdle allows me to control it to make it straight and wherever it might be crooked. And even though these individual pieces went in pretty, pretty cockeyed, when they come out, because they're all bound to each other, they come up pretty straight, reasonably straight. And the main thing is to get them straight enough so that they sit down in the groove and that the nodes have been taken off sufficiently so it sits down in the group. Now it's gonna, it sits up on top. It doesn't go down into the bottom, into the groove until you've actually planed it flat to the, to the tool. So it's always gonna stick out. But this little thing right here, kind of hard to see, there is a big bump here. This is the inner node that I didn't take off. You see, that's not flat at all. So that won't go down into the form. So this needs a little more manhandling before it'll get in there. So, you get it straight and then you start working on your uh, finer form. And so then the strips get smaller and you try and get your basically perfect triangles so you can make your hexagon. And this is not focusing, so I apologize for that. I just have to take my word for it. And then you get to the point where you have really good triangles and then you can bind them together with tape and then you can split the tape in one line and then you're you can now see the inside of the rod and this is the outside so why would i want to do this well when i get to the final 
dimensions, I want to do this and then I'm going to hollow out the rod by using a Dremel tool or a plane and plane out sections, whatever, three, four inches long and take it down to about, I don't know, a couple of millimeters, maybe seven millimeters thick. And those are the hollow areas that give the rod stiffer action. So if you leave it solid like that without stripping it, it's gonna, it's gonna have like a very soft and slow action. But modern rods are hollowed in various ways. They can be scalloped. So like I was just discussing, you would hollow out a certain section. And when you put it back together, you actually see um, holes. Uh, but you can, you know, some of the rod makers are also taking um, rotors and they are roting um, lines into the length of these splines and making them hollow lengthwise as well. There's all kinds of interesting things that people are doing that are way beyond my my skill set and my tools. So I just try and do this as a hobbyist. Um, so when I get to the very final size for the taper that I'm making, and I'll have a separate one for the butt section, and I'll have a separate one for each of the tip sections. Generally, I make two tips, and I make the tips and the butt section equal length, but there are exceptions. And so when I get that to its final dimension, then it has to be glued together. And this is a section this is a tip section that was glued together and we use a certain, there are certain glues that work and certain glues that don't work. I'm using a, a very specialized product called um, Unibond 800, hard to get. It's about 40 bucks a pint and you can make about uh, five or six rod sections with a pint and it goes bad. So you have to use it like within a year of opening it. But you can't do this with Elmer's white glue, for example, if you're asking for trouble doing that. You could use off the shelf things like Unibond or no, um, Tight Bond 3, but um, then you run into a problem with working time. You put it together and you find out, oh, I've, I've mixed something up here. I have to unbind it and straighten it out again. Too late, it'll be glued. There's no rework capability. So, Stuff I use gives you slightly more time to work with it. This one here is my demo. It's a still birth because I bound it and then I didn't discover after the glue dried that a couple of the tip sections, which are tiny, they're like, they're not as thin as hair, but they're not as thick as toothpicks either. Very, very thin. And they got twisted around in underneath here. I didn't realize it till after. Now, if I planed that, and sanded it, you'd never know, but I wouldn't feel right. So that one I, I just kept as an example, but this shows the girdle of the, uh, of the cotton line that I'm using to hold it together. So um, the thing about making your own rod is you can you know, make it look any way you want to. Here's my very first rod. And I decided for whatever reason that I wanted to have a locking reel seat on it. I buy all my parts generally from this little uh, specialty shop in Florida. They just have some stuff that I like and you can get all kinds of things on eBay or special makers. Uh, I buy um, rings, cork rings over the internet. Last time I bought a hundred pieces from Portugal. It ended up being about a buck and a half or something like that a piece for a, for a half inch piece but you can you glue them together and you make it any shape you want i'm using nickel silver uh, parts so it's not the cheapest stuff that you can get so my rods generally have about 200 dollars worth of material in them you can do it for a lot less you can actually you know this is a 40 us dollar ferrule at least when it comes with uh, the two mating ferals, the two males. Let's 
So the female and two males, so you can have two tips, that's about 40 US dollars in nickel silver. But you can get very inexpensive ones. You could get bottomless brass tubes and it would work just as well, but not as nice. Um, you can make your handles do weird things. Brian had a chance to cast a rod with this, uh, what do you call it? It's a fish skeleton type of handle. It's quite fascinating. So I've made them a couple of different ways. One is a way that's got the look, but not the behavior. This one is, is hollow down to the bamboo in the handle. And when you cast it, you can actually feel the action of the bamboo right down into the handle. It's very, very interesting. This is a style that was uh, used by a famous rod maker, Paul Young, uh, he made rods in Detroit in the 50s. And um, I've made several rods using uh, tapers that he, uh, that he developed. Here's one here, it's, a, it's called the Driggs River Taper. It's a four weight line, seven foot, two inch, and uh, it's a two piece. And somewhere, I think in my very last slide of my presentation is a picture of me and I've got like a 20 pound salmon on and this thing is just bowed over. And it didn't break. So I'm glad about that. And I guess uh, what, I've, what I got to in my rod building capability is I got to the point where I could make rods with a, a bamboo ferrule. So completely eliminating the cost of the nickel silver ferrule and it actually has quite a significant impact on the behavior of the rod. So then these are bamboo ferrules and they're more like your modern uh, fiberglass or uh, not fiberglass, but graphite rods where the, the ferrule is integrated in the rod. But traditionally they use the metal, but you can actually imitate these things with bamboo. This is a little bit harder to do. It's, this is not a beginner project. Um, took me a while to figure out how to do it. And they don't stay together that well because I haven't perfected my technique. Got two different versions here. This one here is the original rod specification. And then I've put six bamboo strips on here and and hollowed them out and bound them on. So it's only thick at the, uh, at the ferrule itself. And then there's this type here, which is, this is a built up taper in the rod itself. And I did that with my form by exaggerating the depth I needed by about five to seven thousandths of an inch. And actually, these, these are steel bars, but they can actually bend. And so under pressure, I was actually able to open them up enough to actually make that bigger. The thing about bamboo is that uh, they will take a set. So the tip section will get bent over. And that's generally why you build two, two tips with a rod traditionally, so that you can rest one. So every other trip, you take a different tip. And you don't twist those when you put them on. You push them straight on together, right? Yeah. So with a, uh, with a bamboo rod, when you're pulling the sections apart, you never twist. Always pull straight. And if you get um, sections stuck together and you can't get them apart, usually you can get them apart by putting it behind your knees and using the leverage behind your knees. But that doesn't always work. Um, so the other way to do it is with a buddy. So one person puts their hands above and below the ferrule. And the other person puts their hands up and down, also on opposite sides of the ferrule. And both parties pull straight back and they, they always pop up. It's two horsepower. <laughs> There's one there that says, is the varnish critical to the rod flexibility? Yeah, well, there, you know, if you talk to 20 different rod makers, you'll get 20 different answers on 
how you should finish the rod. So in our club, one fellow uh, swears by tongue oil. Uh, I did most of my rods by dipping them in, in thin down Helmsman spar varnish. I decided I was gonna put on all my, all my thread wraps, guides, ferrules, even the handle and wheel seat, assembled it completely before I put the varnish on. And so I covered up the handle for the dipping, but everything else was exposed and the whole thing was dipped in the varnish and came out. And so there was even varnish inside the line guides, but it, it's like water thin, so it doesn't really go, it doesn't go in there, it doesn't block anything. And after a while, it just wears off and it doesn't ruin the finish at all. Then as I got into it, I met a guy at an old real convention of all places. I met a guy that builds rods. He had a business card. He said he was a master rod builder. I just laughed when I saw that. And then I looked at the rods. He had, holy smokes, they were so good. And I said, how do you finish those off? They're like, perfect. And he said, it's simple. I just use some wipe on poly and a, and a bounty paper towel. And I just dip the paper towel in the, in the, poly and I do one wipe down the rod and two sides each swipe and I hang it to dry and a couple hours later I can go do another one and he was right and so I started doing them that way and I've done a couple and they came out great uh, I think it was one of the ones I was showing you these ones were done with wipe on poly and there is no drips it's perfect it's because you don't put anything on them. It's like you're putting like spit on them. There's nothing to it. And it gives you a very nice finish and they're perfectly flexible. It doesn't change the way it behaves. Traditionally, the old days they used spar varnish, which is a certain kind of varnish they used on uh, ship spars. And the main characteristic that comes to mind is that it never dries out. So when you get an old bamboo rod at a flea market, you know, an old hardy, and it's all gummy, it's because it's got spar varnish on the damn thing never sets. There's also the glue, but the glue sets pretty much. When I make this glue formula, it's a two-part formula with powder and resin. And you mix it up in a cup. It's, you do it by weight. So the powder and the resin is weight, depending on the room temperature and depending on how fast you want it to set because it has different commercial applications. It's not just for rod building. And um, so what I do is I, I mix up the batch, I paint the strips of the rod, I bind them quickly, paint the next set, bind them, paint the next set, bind them. Then I put the remaining uh, epoxy or whatever it is into a paper cup and I let it sit. And when that gets hard, like, like a hard, like a hockey puck all the way through or harder, that's when I know that my rod has set. Before you go and refurbish a rod, it's probably better if you learn how to build a rod from scratch, but you want to get a book on how to do it. So this explains what you do in general. Um, and how you put it back together. But they, so this will show you detailed diagrams of some, just a few famous rods, but it gives you a flavor of what's involved if you want. Anyhow, I basically showed you one that I wanted to show you there. Yeah. There's books and other old rods and stuff like that. So, so that's a wrap. I think we've run out of time. Yeah.